So the interesting thing about Actix, um, some of you might have seen the Actix web, um, web framework, is that it's built on top of this other thing called Actix, which doesn't actually have any documentation. <laughs> Uh, so I was looking at it, what is that thing? It looks pretty interesting. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about, not so much Actis Web. Um, so what is it? It's a Rust library for concurrent programming. It's sort of loosely based on the actor model. Ideas, you can pass messages back and forth between actors and um, cross threads run um, asynchronous and synchronous code in the same program. Um, so if you've ever written something in, um, in Node and you needed to talk to a database and you did that from inside of an HTTP handler, you might have run into this little problem. Um, it blocked your program, which meant that nothing happened <laughs> for all of the other HTTP requests while that was going on. And when I was looking into this, I realized that's what this is for. Um, so quick thing on actor model. This idea has um, been around a long time. It's used in Erlang, ACO, on the scale of um, JVM. Um, you can set up an, an actor, which is just a piece of code that receives messages, processes them hopefully in order, and um, you run it with a mailbox, sort of like a queue. It's kind of like um, RPCs that have a buffer. Um, looks kind of like this, abstractly. The uh, these different pieces in that model might not be on the same computer. They might be in different processes. They might be uh, in different data centers. Um, Actix doesn't do any of this. <laughs> <laughs> I said loosely. <laughs> well, loosely turns out that means it has mailboxes. <laughs> <laughs> the distributed part, they didn't actually implement that. Um, so in the actor model, you have more or less a couple of things you can do. You can send um, messages do something about them in your own internal state, and you could maybe create another actor to go deal with it. Um, there's a lot of formalism behind that. Again, they didn't need to do that because they said loosely based. <laughs> um, so what is it actually in Actix? And it turns out that it's just this trait. They, go away. Um, so this primarily just means you handle messages. A message turns out to mostly be a struct that happens to implement um, handler. This goes into what, um, what an actor has to do. It has to provide a handler implementation for each message it wants to receive. So if you go in to use this sort of model in Erlang, that's all dynamically typed. If you do it in Scala, it, I don't think it has the same um, type of strictness on it. This forces um, the data types of all these things would be predetermined so you get consistent behavior. And it looks sort of like this. An empty um, struct that does has nothing. It doesn't matter. But we're, we care about the type of it, and it's associating a, um, a result type, which we're all familiar with. And then to actually handle that, um, the boilerplate here brings in all of the behavior from Actix so that my code doesn't care. And I write something to, um, to handle it, which looks like this. Extremely trivial, and um, <coughs> the contents of this are up to my code. Um, what I do with it, again, up to my code. And they've built a mechanism where this, this context type brings in the behavior. So that isn't, doesn't have to be explicitly set up. It can be overridden, but it's brought in and typed in by using impl actor and bringing in all of the default behavior for that trait. There's two behaviors you can bring in um, with a tokio event loop and a thread pool and consumer queue. That's how you get the separate synchronous and asynchronous behavior in the same program that can talk to each other. Um, in that last slide, if we swapped context out here and here with sync context, suddenly this actor would be a synchronous actor that can block. But things that called it from asynchronous code would get a feature back. 
that separation um, essentially lets me write a program that um, contains a piece that can go off and talk to uh, C that does, doesn't care about features or um, writes system calls in there and, and just completely ignore the fact that I'm operating in an async program because I've partitioned that out and it runs in a thread pool and, and it's, it's, it's all stuff I don't have to care about is the programmer because that, that's what that system brings in. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead because this talk was originally about an hour long. Um, <laughs> so the interesting bit, what can you do with this? To me, um, this should be the blink tag here, you know. <laughs> I can compose these. I can make these pieces talk and I don't lose my mind in the process. <laughs> Um, because I've had to do this in C++ <laughs> and worse, I've had to fix other people's code that did this in C++. Um, Actix is fantastic by comparison. <laughs> um, so, Actix Web. This builds on top of it, runs in stable, um, does, which is very nice because some of you might have noticed Rocket not running in stable. Um, has a nice collection of all the usual things that you expect a, a web framework to have. Looks something like this to use. I set up a resource, uh, bind it to a port. I say, okay, run inbox. Okay, very good. That's all simple enough. Um, the exciting bit is that that's an actor. It fits into that system and can interact with other things that might be much larger. Um, you might easily be able to fit this into a program that's 90% not a web server, but does do things that um, do not fit at all into an async um, event-driven program. Um, so I did an example, trying to test this out for myself. And I tried to use a few too many things all at once. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing was this bit, which um, is a constant database C library. It's trying to do um, system calls to access files. It's expecting that it owns that thread. It will block. I knew that it would block, and that was uh, very much the point of, of testing this, um, was to make sure that it, the behavior was, in fact, what I thought it was. So it looks something like this. Um, I loaded up a a very simple JSON file with a bunch of country data, and my web service gets that request, issues a message containing a string saying, I'm looking for this country. Go look that up. At this point, it crosses the boundary between asynchronous, and this whole thread can go off and do other things until that request comes, response comes back. So now, you know, on this side of it, we could be dealing with thousands of HTTP requests. That web server doesn't care. In the other thread, I can go and take as long as I need to to go get that information, deserialize it, um, send it back, and then it get back to the HTTP request that came in. Nice visual on it. Um, the I, can, I didn't have a way to show hundreds of these things and have it mean anything to anyone. So. So do we have time for any demonstration? Right. Now that I've remembered how to operate this. Um, so this goes and grabs um, this piece of JSON, which was not stored in JSON, by the way. The um, very first thing it does is I see this HTTP thread come up. It enters a function called index, which immediately exits, because all it did was send a message to this other actor running in a different thread called MTBL to go and get that. Um, these time frames, by the way, are, are very nice. Um, <laughs> very respectable timing for, uh, for what this is doing. At this point, sends a response back through the channel, and this thread wakes up again and is able to send the response, which is often another function. Um, I spent more time actually figuring out how to make this logging um, show me what was happening <laughs> <laughs> than in the rest of the program because that's actually the interesting part <laughs> is seeing what's happening. Um, let's see. But 
you know, JSON's kind of hard to read when it's bunched up like that. So let's let's make it more fun. So I have it switched to YAML. Um, and in this function, I put the de uh, the uh, reserialize. After doing that, I realized, you know, it really should have happened over here because I didn't need to block for that. <laughs> but it seems to be fine. Um, I can also go off and do um, a little faster that, and I just get a um, rendered HTML template. Again, um, same functionality, very very simple demonstration, but showing the crossover between threads, the um, the non-blocking behavior, which was what I was after, 